thank you all for tuning into this event. I am Andrew Welton, a professor of civil, environmental, and ecological engineering at Purdue University. In co-moderating this event today is Professor Caitlin Proctor, also at Purdue University in agricultural, biological, environmental, and ecological engineering. We're thrilled to be here today with these amazing three individuals. <clears throat> they have expertise in journalism, communications, policy, and just downright amazing life experiences that they're going to thankfully share with us today. The goal of this event is to provide attendees and participants some better perspective about journalism policy and science communication in today's environment. This event is supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation. This project is that was awarded to Purdue focuses on better understanding building water safety, but also helping scientists better communicate with journalists, policymakers, and getting their results out into the public domain. Some of today's audience includes university and college professionals, whether they be students, staff, faculty. Many of them are conducting their own studies right now on water safety in buildings, testing building water systems, looking at policies, understanding exposures. But what's really awesome is that we also have leaders of industry on the phone too, listening in. So we have people that manufacture products, that sell products. We also have government officials on the line listening in too. People at major government agencies that deal with water, policy, and health are listening in too. And so, and finally, something that really surprised me, which is pretty cool, is that we have multiple countries represented. So listening in right now are people from the United States, Canada, Italy, Switzerland, and Finland. So the discussion that we have today will have global reach. And with that, I'd like to see if Dr. Proctor would like to introduce the panelists. Of course. Uh, before I introduce panelists, I just want to briefly remind listeners um, of a few things. So you guys are encouraged to submit questions through the Q&A, and that can include technical questions if you have any issues. Uh, the chat feature has been disabled, but uh, we will be monitoring those questions closely throughout the event. Uh, to provide some substance for this discussion, we're honored to have three accomplished guests that I hope you can all see using gallery view. First, I'd like to introduce Ken Ward Jr. Ken is an investigative journalist whose in-depth coverage of the coal, chemical, and natural gas industries in West Virginia is exposing the true economic, social, and health impacts of industrial abuse on Appalachian residents and communities. After working more than 25 years for the Charleston Gazette newspaper, Ward co-founded the new nonprofit investigative newsroom, Mountain State Spotlight and is a distinguished, distinguished local reporting fellow at ProPublica. Welcome, Mr. Ward. Next, it's my honor to introduce Deborah Bloom. Deborah is a Pulitzer Prize winning American science journalist, columnist, and author of six books, including The Poison Squad from 2018 and The Poisoner's Handbook from 2010. She is a former president of the National Association of Science Writers, was a member of the governing board of the World Federation of Science Writers, and currently serves on the Board of Advisors of the Council of the Advancement of Science Writing. Bloom is co-editor of the book, A Field Guide for Science Writers, and in 2015 was selected as the fourth director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thanks to Deborah for participating today. And finally, we have Seth Siegel joining us today. Mr. Siegel is the author of New York Times bestseller, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World, now out in 19 languages and available in more than 50 countries. Seth is also the author of Troubled Waters, What's Wrong with What We Drink. His essays on water and other issues have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and in leading publications in Europe and Asia. He is a senior policy fellow at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. His newest book, Other People's Words, come out, comes out this uh, coming May in May 2021. 20, Seth, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. 
<laughs> these individuals are truly leaders in their fields, and we thank all of them for joining us. Uh, and right now, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Walton to get this conversation started. Thank you, Dr. Proctor, and thank you all for, for joining us today to share with us your, your thoughts and insights. I, I must say, last night, I, I had uh, pins and needles a little bit, so excited about this event today, and I was trying to make sure that we had questions from all the listeners that had sent them in to make sure that they were formed the right way. So um, if I stumble a little bit, you know, uh, it's okay to laugh and, uh, and answer the question. So thank you so much. <clears throat> This meeting is being recorded. A copy of this meeting will be posted at plumbingsafety.org in the coming weeks. And in advance of this event, we did receive a lot of questions from listeners, from the types of individuals that I mentioned before, and we've tried to fashion them into questions. We do encourage listeners right now to post their questions in the Q&A box. And what we will do during this event is kind of weave them into this discussion. So please do post your questions. And with that, you know, let's move on to hearing from some of our panelists. So <clears throat> for the panelists, much of our audience, as I mentioned, are science and engineers and public health officials who either have uh, investigate and try to solve complex problems and then try to translate that policy, that data into policy, right, to, to improve people's lives, whether through technology or processes. And many of them have questions about journalism and policy, right? These, these words are generally not taught to science and engineers in the roles that, that you all are familiar with, right? So can you maybe each introduce yourself and share with us just a little bit about your role in the communication of knowledge uh, with science or with the public and policymakers? Maybe Deborah, we'll start with you. Thanks, and thanks for having me on this panel. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so I'm director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT, and I pub I'm publisher of a magazine, Undark, which looks at the sort of push and pull between science and society. So it tends often to be policy focused because that's been in my long experience, long experience as a science journalist, one of the things that we've tended not to do always that well is to connect those two dots. Uh, for myself, I think of myself as a science journalist who is interested in science in our everyday lives. That, and, and I think of what I do is trying to provide readers, I, you know, I'm a, a word journalist rather than an audio journalist or a video journalist, but to provide readers with some tools to navigate the world around them I guess I would say according to science. I, you know, I think one of the things that science journalists can do really well, once you think of the audience you want to reach, and for me, it's often the non-science literate audience, the audience not around the science campfire. How do I reach that audience? And how do I give them the tools they need so that they can see and feel comfortable with using scientific knowledge in the way they make their decisions. I mean, we all do that anyway, but I think there's some resistance to it and some science fear out there. So my job is to get across those bridges and try to establish essentially a conversation in which people feel more comfortable with science. That's, that's awesome. And the, the, the words, you know, science campfire, you know, kind of gives it that that emotional connection to to um, sharing knowledge and, and experiences. So thank you, thank you. Uh, Ken, would you like to share with us a little bit about your perspectives? Sure, thank you. And uh, thanks for having me as part of this panel. Uh, very uh, interested to hear all of this discussion. Um, uh, I guess I'll start by, I, I um, uh, you know, we all hate social media, I guess, sometimes, but it was really uh, something this morning when I just checked to see, is there anything going on in West Virginia I need to know about? And uh, that, that um, this thing you may have heard of is called Facebook, uh, had a, uh, one of these memories for me. Uh, and the memory was, uh, Dr. Welton will uh, recognize this perhaps, the memory was February 11th, 2014. 
uh, and it was a quote, uh, the scale of chemical contamination in the drinking water in Charleston, West Virginia has been unprecedented. There is so little data available. Many federal and state agencies could not and still cannot answer all the questions West Virginians are demanding to be answered. Uh, and that was a quote from Dr. Andrew Welton uh, uh, about the chemical spill that happened at the Freedom Industries site in my community. Um, and it, it, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really something that's been, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's hard to believe it's been uh, seven years. Um, uh, sometimes it seems shorter and sometimes it seems longer. But it, it really captures like kind of where my role intersects with what we're talking about here, because I'm not, I'm absolutely not a scientist and I'm not even really a science journalist. I don't think of myself as a science writer. Um, uh, I'm an investigative reporter. Uh, for many years, I was a beat reporter, but my, my beats covering coal and chemicals and natural gas in West Virginia intersected so much with science, unfortunately, many times intersected with science because of something really bad that happened in one of those industries that hurt a lot of people. Um, and so one of the more difficult things often to explain uh, is all of the things that science doesn't know for sure. And in, this particular in this particular incident, there's been hardly any testing uh, of the chemical in question here. Uh, so uh, despite the best efforts of a lot of people in the public sphere to uh, tell what uh, my neighbors, there's nothing here to worry about, no big deal, don't worry, you know, it, it, everything's fine. Uh, it turned out when a, a scientist who uh, wasn't connected with all of the, all of the bureaucracy here uh, started asking questions that, gosh, there weren't a lot of answers. Uh, and so that became a really important part of science to communicate is what we don't know. Uh, often in science, in the field that I, fields that I write about, there are things we do know very well. We know what causes black lung disease and we know how to stop it. Uh, so the decisions about that that's, that society makes are not scientific ones, uh, they are public policy and economic ones. Uh, so one of the most important things for investigative reporters to do is to be able to uh, parse out what is the science here versus what is the economics versus what is the societal value. Uh, so one of the things, one of the, the points I, I think that my work has to do with and that I, I hope we talk a little bit about is, is um, scientists and journalists working together to be transparent with the public about what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and uh, that brings in lots of complicated questions about risk and uh, whose risk and who wins and who loses. And, but, but, but understanding what science knows and what, and what science doesn't know is, know is really an important part of journalism. Uh, and so I, I, uh, I was just astounded that that quote happened to pop up on my Facebook feed first thing this morning. That is, uh, that is amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we will get to the, the question about science and journalists working together and conflicts of interest and all sorts of other things too. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, Seth, um, you know, many questions, many listeners have questions about policy. While there's a journalism component, there's sometimes this, this disparate policy um, action that takes place. And, and to a lot of people, policy is just a nebulous word. You know, in your experiences, you know, what, what would you have to share about like the role of policy in communicating knowledge or receiving those communications and, and interpreting them? Uh, thank you. Th thank you, uh, Professor Welton and Professor Proctor for having me here. Uh, I'm honored to be on such a, a prestigious panel. Uh, th so thank you very much. I, I, I'll just take a word to, since the others had a chance to introduce themselves, let me take a word to introduce myself as well and I'll answer your question then. Uh, so I have had an interesting and polyglot uh, business life uh, or professional life. I, currently, in the last many years, I write books, but I still don't consider myself to be a writer. And that is because I'm using the books as a tool. My writing is, is intentional. I'll back into your question here. I write these books as a means of, of provoking, responsibly provoking with fact and information, but responsibly provoking a public interest and a public response. Uh, I began my professional life as a lawyer. I then, uh, after about six years working in a, in a law firm, I uh, became a business person. I had an idea for a business. They called them an entrepreneur, I guess. And I did that for qu 
quite a number of years. I then had a, a, a very successful and happy exit uh, from the business world uh, when a large corporation bought my company. But those 24 years in the business world also gave me an appreciation for the needs of business people and the interactions uh, and with hundreds and maybe thousands of interactions with other business people came to understand their culture. Upon the sale of my business, rather than going back into business, trying to make more money, I decided to devote the rest of my life to, to call it the not-for-profit world or the policy world. <clears throat> that ult I didn't immediately start writing books. I spent about 10 years learning and that led me to then start writing. Um, and here's what I think about the policy piece to get into your question now. Um, I think that uh, first is that we need to understand that we need to have all hands on deck. There's a, we're, we live in a very polarized society and I am not part of that polarization process. I refuse to be labeled. I refuse to label other people because I think if we're gonna solve society's problems, pointing fingers and making people bad guys, even people who do things that are socially irresponsible, pointing fingers does not really get you anywhere. Obviously, if somebody commits a criminal act, that's something different and they should be punished for that. But you need to have academia, you need to have the scientific community, you need to have the business community, you need to have journalists, you need to have, you need to have people at large, the political class, you need all of them to understand what the issues are, what the needs are, the concerns are. And when they do, if each of them is given the proper motivations, elected officials being reelected, business people being sure that businesses aren't destroyed and that they have profit opportunities, academics getting grants and getting tenure and being able to teach students. I mean, each has their own prompts, their own incentives, their own motivations, and you need to work to those motivations. But ultimately the, the way policy gets changed in America is not from on high down. It is a very rare time when you have a very dynamic public official, a Franklin Delano Roosevelt say, who comes to office and says, we need to change this many different things to create a new society. What generally happens is a highly incremental process. And that incrementalism starts with a public demand for that change. And so what I try to do with my many, many, I mean, I've given literally hundreds and almost, almost 400 now speeches to audiences since I started uh, this, this endeavor of being a public educator. Um, I try to educate people for the purpose of getting them motivated not just to passively take in information, but to say to them, what do you wanna to say to your public officials? What do you wanna to say to your local journalists? How do you wanna change your civic conversation? And when you have that conversation, suddenly it will percolate downward and upward and it will create a demand for change. In the process of writing, particularly my, my newer book, Troubled Water, but also in the research for, um, for Let There Be Water, what I discovered was fascinating to me, which is almost every major change in, in water, certainly in the United States, only came about after there was either a crisis that politicians responded to, which is a way of saying they responded to the public, or there was a groundswell of grassroots demand for something which led to that change. You know, we, we sort of speak about politically about soccer moms. Soccer moms change society more than any conference of professors that you have ever seen. And that is because the fact that the political class, the journalist class, the business class, all will respond to those people and responding in one way or another to their needs. And when they are motivated, when they care about the contamination of their drinking water, when they care about the effect of this on their fetuses or on their newborns or their grandchildren, that's when you're going to see the ultimate change. Okay, great. Thank you for, for um, sharing with us your background. And uh, one of the reasons why you are here is because of your diverse business uh, experiences and, and the advocacy uh, for policy. And also at the time, uh, you didn't mention that you spent in DC um, talking with these elected leaders and policymakers to, to kind of figure out how how they think. I, I, did, I did not say that, but I have had the opportunity to speak with, I mean, I've had now thousands of conversations. I, for, for 15 years, I budgeted three to five days every month to spend in Washington, DC, where I befriended uh, politicians, elected officials of both parties and of all regions of the United States, senators, congressmen. And what I came to learn is that anyone who thinks that you can affect change by meeting an elected official single time or thinks even that that's lobbying, citizen lobbying, not the bad lobbying, you know, corporate lobbying. Um, uh, you're crazy. 
it takes, it takes months or even years of month after month meetings for them to come to know you and trust you and trust the information you're giving them before it's likely that they will ever move or either sponsor a, a, a dear colleague letter or sign on to a resolution or best of all, introduce legislation. It takes a very long time, but I, I personally find it to be a very, uh, a, a very valuable use of time. If you, have, if, you, if you have the ability to do so, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to do so. Great, thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, to kind of start the, the broad discussion today, um, we throw around the term journalist, we throw around the term journalism policy, but, you know, many of us in the science and engineering community don't get exposed to that, right? The way we get exposed to it is at a meeting, somebody invokes that, you know, I'm a journalist. That might be the first time where you get an email, I'm a journalist and, I, and I'm interested in this or I'm looking for somebody who's an expert in this, can you help me? Um, and so we, we wanted to go to maybe uh, Deborah first to start this off, you know, as, as the director of MIT's Night School of Journalism, you educate professionals that ultimately are, and then maybe not yet, but then become journalists. So, so you have a very unique perspective and you also were a journalist and you were at the SAC B and, and some other places around the country so I guess if you were explaining to a scientist, an engineer, public health official, so, so what's a journalist? But what would you say to them? And to me, journalism is independent inquiry. So I, and I think that the core of it is both the independence uh, and the integrity of the question in which you ask it without uh, prejudice, I suppose, right? You may have a, uh, idea of what your story is going to be, but what you're really doing is exploring an issue without um, allegiance to your sources. I, and when I, I've, so I have been a journalist a long time. I got my grad degree in science journalism from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I went back there and was a, a pro journalism professor there. Here at MIT, I am not a professor. I am a director of a fellowship program. So I work with mid-career science journalists from around the world. And the, and the sort of focus of our program is to try to raise the bar in good science journalism. And, um, and that's one of the reasons that we started publishing this magazine. But I start with the idea that journalism is independent inquiry. I want to know how this works. And, and I want to do this not in the service of my sources. I've been a science journalist a long time. I have a, a, you know, long, deep relationships with scientists in different areas that I've covered from primate research early on to toxicology for, you know, more than about a decade now. But when I'm doing a story, they're not uh, who I'm working for. I don't work for my sources my allegiances to my readers and, and to try to open up this issue for them in a way that they can both understand it, which goes back to my earlier point about sharing information in a way that people are comfortable with and, and, and try to make their own decisions about what happened here, right? I'm not, my job is not to tell them how to think but my job is to explore the issue in a way that they can try to make an intelligent decision. And I, I wanna close that up by saying, you know, I, I don't have any patience for people who have contempt for their readers. Hmm. I spent a lot of time both as a journalist and as a book author going on book tour, talking to all different kinds of people. And, and I like to think of my readership as being smart enough to get it. And if they don't get it, it's because I let them down. It's not because they're not smart enough. So I, you know, to me, those are at least some of the fundamentals in the way I think good journalism works. Um, and that would be true, I think, not just for science journalism, but for journalism in general. Great, great, very, very insightful and, and a lot of experience, definitely. Ken, do you want to weigh in here? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I I agree with so much that 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 was said there. The you know the uh, especially about who who we're working for and not working for sources. Um, I used to tell uh, editors and the people that own the newspaper where I worked that contrary to what they thought, I didn't work for them. 
Uh, I work for the readers. Um, I, I don't know, maybe that explains why I'm not working there anymore. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think that that's, there really is a, uh, especially among local journalism, there's a lot of talk about local journalism today. There's really a bond between communities. If, if, I mean, I've lived in West Virginia my whole life and, and care deeply about the place and the people here. And, and I think that that idea of working for your readers is, is really important. Um, you know, I guess the the uh, it's been it's been attributed to Orwell many times. I I, I think perhaps inaccurately that uh, journalism is print is, journalism is printing what somebody doesn't want to be known. Uh, all the rest is PR, and and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I also this you know this kind of discussion makes me think a lot about my my father who who passed away a few years ago, but was a, a high school science teacher for 33 years. Um, and used to tell me when I was talking to him about how I wanted to go work for a newspaper that uh, that I should take more science classes. It turns out he was right, um, uh, and uh, and preached that to me that reporters should use the scientific method uh, and uh, you know f try to have an honest inquiry. And but the part that I liked the best was that it's okay for a journal, like a scientist, it's okay for a journalist to have a hypothesis when they start reporting, uh, and and to think I think this is what's going on here, uh, but you have to look for evidence of it, and most importantly, journalists need to look for the contrary evidence. Is there something out there that that tells me that my hypothesis was wrong? So I think this the idea that journalism is is honest inquiry. Uh, and that it's it's not in the service of sources and it's not PR uh, and it's it's aimed at helping people to understand the world around them. And I think also, you know, by the way, you know, when we start talking about not pointing fingers and and how public policy gets made, it's also important for journalists and for scientists also to understand where power is, uh, because the power to make change based on science is not distributed equally in our society. Uh, some people have more than others. Uh, and so part of the job of a journalist um, is to lift up voices that otherwise might not be heard as clearly. And, and I think actually part of the role of a scientist is to lift up ideas that might not have been heard before that are important parts of public, pub, you know, public debate. And that sort of, that that sh that value about transparency is something that that I think journalists and scientists share. And despite all of the ways that journalists and scientists kind of often don't mesh well together, uh, if we can find that shared value and talk more about it, I think I think journalists and scientists will both be better off. Great, thanks thanks for that that insight. And just staying on the. The topic of journalism is a couple terms that came up um, from listeners. One was, you know, if somebody asked me to go on the record, what does that mean? And if somebody says, hey, I'd like to record this conversation, what does that mean? And then maybe do journalists record conversations and don't tell you? Like what, how, how do things go like this? As a, as a scientist listening in, this might be the first time that they have these experiences with with people and, and they don't necessarily know what to expect. Deborah? I mean, I think those are great questions. And, and it's a reminder of something that I do when I'm doing an interview, which is to try in the way that Ken was talking about transparency, to be very upfront about what some of the rules are of, of engagement are, because a good interview is a good conversation. And you have to have some kind of level of mutual trust and understanding. And on either side, you can ask for that. So I think um, you should, when you're going into an interview, uh, have a clear understanding of what off the record means to the journalist you're working with, because it can mean different things to different journalists. Um, and, and your fixed idea of what it means is not always right. I, I've known journalists for whom off the record meant, I can use this information, but not your name. I've known people who thought it meant you won't use this information at all, right? I've known people, you know, who think I'm going to say off the record and the journalist is not going to use that in another interview even. So you, you want to really say 
if the journalists, if you say off the record, you know, stop and say, what does that mean to you personally? It doesn't mean the same thing to every journalist. You have the right to ask that question. And I think you also have the right to try to get some sense of, I'm going to tell you now that when I'm doing a story, I don't always put all my cards on the table about where I'm going. Sometimes it's because I don't know where I'm going. I mean, going back to the idea of a story as a hypothesis, I'll come up with an idea about the story, but the interviews are evidence gathering. Does this hold up, right? And in the course of doing the interviews, my idea of what the story is gonna be often will change. Uh, so you'll find a lot of times, I'll find a lot of times when I'll do an interview, the last thing I say is, is it okay if I have any other questions if I come back to you? because one of the things I know is I may be four interviews down the road, realize that the way I wanna tell the story has changed. And I want to be able to go back to that first scientist and say, you know, my vision of this has changed and, and can we discuss it now from this angle? But all of that involves, you know, a give and take and a knowledge of the reporter and, and an ability to set those kind of comfort levels. And, and I think scientists you know, often don't realize that they have some ability to you know, set, you know, have this back and forth. And I think they should, they should know that and I think they should use it. Okay, thank you. Ken, can you maybe share with us just a little, I know you've, you've had probably thousands of interviews or, or engagements with people on the record, off the record or, or whatnot. You know, um, for a, let's say a, a new scientist coming out and they have a really important study that maybe flips something on its head or, or goes and shows that there may be an issue that policymakers maybe need to consider and they go into an interview, what, I mean, what, what advice would you have for them? I think, I, I think Deborah gave the, the best advice, which is to, to uh, if you were the scientist to be very clear and ask what is off the record, what does on background, what do all these things mean to you? Because I know just just the in the newsroom I used to work, in the newsroom I work now, everybody's got a little different ideas about it. And so I think it, it just needs to be clear, what are we talking about here? Uh, of, and, and what do you mean by those terms? And um, I think that from a journalist point of view, I think journalists, especially young journalists that I run into, they give away off the record or on background too easily to people who are public officials or corporate officials or people they're trying to hold accountable. Um, and, and I think that's very dangerous because like if, I, if, 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 uh, if I'm interviewing uh, the, uh, Dr. Andrew Welton about the water in West Virginia and he says, well, can we talk off the record about this? And then he says, guess what? We just found this and it's really awful, but we really don't want to tell anybody because it's going to scare the crap out of everybody. Well, I'm kind of, I'm really screwed then because he told me this thing that's incredibly important, but I've agreed that I won't share it with anyone. And so I think that that's a really sort of dangerous thing. And I think there, I think there are kind of different spheres of this for scientists. You know, if, if you're, there's a lot of scientists who are on the public payroll to work at public agencies who are public officials whose job it is to protect the public, whether it's water quality or uh, car safety or what have you, and and I think that 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 uh, that those folks have a responsibility to talk on the record to journalists about their work. And there's a lot of things that go on, obviously, with political appointees. Over the, it's getting getting worse. It started getting worse under President Obama, I think, uh, where there's lots of these blockers that keep people keep scientists from talking. We obviously saw tons of that during the previous administration. Remains to be seen if that will get better under the Biden administration. Um, but I, I think it's just really important for everybody to be clear about it. And it, it's okay for it to be a bit of a back and forth. It has to be okay if the scientist is like, I really don't wanna talk on the record. And it's okay for me as a journalist to then talk to them on the re off the record and then say, hey, but this thing that you said, is there, why can't we have that on the record? Let's talk about why that has to be off the record. And, it, and, and it, at least I, and it's important for scientists to understand a good journalist is always going to be trying to pull those things that, even if you agree to talk talk off the record, the journalist is always going to be trying to pull some of them out into the public record because that's our that's our job. Um, 
So I, I just think, I, I, I think there's that, that look, I, I go back again to this, what, what should be a shared value about transparency. Um, and on, on the scientist side of that relationship, scientists need to understand that if they're doing work in the public sphere that, that the public needs to know about, they need to be transparent. By the same token, journalists, one of the reasons scientists don't want to do that, and lots of people don't want to talk to, to journalists on the record, is because too many journalists are looking for some gaffe, or they're looking for like conflict for conflict's sake. Uh, and, and, and that leads people to be worried that uh, if, they, if they trip up where they don't say something exactly the right way, they're going to get just really nailed. So I think that that's kind of dishonest of journalists to, to work that way. So I think we both have, both sides of the conversation have to try to, 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 to find better ways to communicate. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, along the lines of, of journalists and, and scientists, Seth, um, policymakers clearly pay attention to the news and, and what's written and said. You know, in your experience, um, how how where have policymakers been sometimes when when discussing a water safety issue? I mean, do they know? Do, do they they watch or read certain things? Do they get most of their information from constituents? You know, wh where do they get their information? I think there's I think there's two separate elements here. Um, uh, first is I think you would be quite startled as to how little most elected officials know about water issues of any kind, unless Either A, they started out um, as one U.S. Senator was the state water commissioner prior to running for U.S. Senate. Uh, so they know very, or if they come from a district where they themselves were a farmer or they have a, a district that's mostly agricultural and therefore irrigation is a key issue. But short of that, um, I think most people would be startled to discover how little most elected officials know about water. And even when you get to the local level, where, where water you would think would be even more important, uh, I'm oftentimes startled to the degree to which um, state uh, legislators, uh, people in the governor's office, and, and even in the mayor's offices are, are largely unaware of, of, um, of water contamination issues, water safety issues, water infrastructure issues. They maybe know about budgeting around water, but that's about it. Number one. Number two issue is that water is, is, we have a very dishonest relationship with water in the United States. And that is because we don't have a market-based system. We have a system where water is either highly subsidized or water pricing is significantly higher than it should be, but not because you're getting better water, but because the municipality is using those water fees as a way of balancing the budget. They steal money. They take money from water and sewage fees, sometimes as much as five-sixths, of the total of the total billing that goes into other municipal functions, and when you have that as a phenomenon, you can't have that with privately owned because they're under a rate commission. But 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 municipalities, which is eighty five percent of all uh, U.S. water utilities, uh, can get away with that, and they do get away with that because it's a it's a cheap and easy way to not pass a tax increase, but to increase local revenues, particularly when there's a falling tax base in the community, and so there's a lot of that. Um, and, so, and so elected officials, again, other than a budgetary connection, really know very little about water, which again goes back to my, my point about troubled water, which I wrote it as a primer, for the average citizen to use it as a guidebook for educating their elected official. The final thing I'd like to say, and this, um, I, I bet, I'll bet a nickel that both Ken and Deborah will say, yep, my experience too, <laughs> is that um, because uh, I'm not a journalist. I don't interview these elected, I've interviewed lots of elected officials for my books, but those are much longer types of conversations that go on over a period of, of sometimes weeks or even months. And I do go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, but I, I think that the public would be surprised to note that elected officials are traumatized by the rare time when they are honest and confessional and let their guard down with the journalists and how badly they've been burned. Not every time. I mean, sure, Ken and Deborah are, are extremely, uh, have high levels of integrity, but there are so many journalists today who are not focused on telling the facts to their readers, who don't really respect their readers, who are ideologically driven, or who are in search of a big prize so that they can make waves by, I think one of Ken or Deborah mentioned this, you know, sort of a gotcha kind of interview. 
And therefore, what has happened is we've not a dumbing down of the conversation, but a, a, a robot, robotization of the conversation. And so when I speak to an elected official privately and we develop relationships, they are funny, they are smart, they are engaging, they are you know, sort of conversationally risk takers. And then you see them, sometimes I'll be with them when they're, you know, they'll have to take a radio interview or, or you know, I'll be, on the, I'll be with them when they go for it because I become friendly with quite a number of them. They go for an interview and I'll sit in on it. It's shocking. They speak in complete robotic phraseology. And when I say to them afterwards, what was that about? You know, I don't even ask anymore because now I know, what was that about? Are you kidding me? Give them the stump speech, give them nothing that can get me in trouble. It doesn't matter if I convey information properly or not. And there's, a, there's, an old, there's an old quotation, which I have in my new book, uh, Other People's Words, which is it's, it's a, a, a great political speech is basically about nothing. And it's harder to achieve that than you would imagine. Uh, and, and, so, and so that carries through to the way they talk to journalists and the way they engage oftentimes with their publics as well. It's risk minimization, which means it's information deprivation. But that's really interesting, and and I've heard that too. Does, does Deborah or or Ken want to to share some perspective on that? On the way that people talk to journalists, especially if they have uh, their political uh, lives at stake, they're careful, right? And I don't blame them. I mean, I will say this, and it's frustrating to me. I, I never defend all journalists, right? It, it, we're a human profession like any other profession and mixed into the profession are gonna be people who behave just as Seth said, you know, they, they're looking for the gotcha story or the clickbait story, you know, in our digital time, they um, are thinking about how they're gonna advance themselves. I, I, I don't think that's anything out of the norm. I mean, I am a, a longtime science journalist. I've been a working science journalist now uh, for most of my life, actually, right? Which is kind of a horrifying thought. I, I, it's frustrating to me to see the entire professor of journalism tarred with that, however, because I know it's not true. Most of the people that I work with want to get a story and they want to get it right and they're trying to do their best to convey complicated issues of science. You know, obviously this is my community to the general public. Uh, and they're looking for people who are gonna talk to them about that with honesty and, and take some time to really explain it well and acknowledge the consequences as in one of the points of our conversation is that science doesn't exist in a vacuum and, and can inform policy and should inform policy in fact. And so you run into this kind of buzzsaw of hostility, this oversimplification of the idea that all journalists are out to get you, right? This unwillingness to, to talk to even people who are really trying to put across a good story, this fear that people are going to, you know, get it wrong or make you look bad. And that's not only politicians, that's just about everyone. And so the information doesn't get shared the way it should. And good journalists who are really trying to tell the story well don't have the information they need to tell the story the way it needs to be told. And so while I want to acknowledge that those factors exist in journalism, um, you know, if you go back to the definite, I don't consider some of the uh, agenda driven uh, people who call themselves journalists necessarily journalists. They have an agenda. You know, a good reporter is, operates on a different function and it's very difficult in this age when I think people are even confused about who a journalist is um, to try to sort through to the point that you can just say to people, I really do wanna tell an honest story here and I'm not gonna be able to tell it unless you give me honest information, right? And that just tends to collide all the time in ways that going back to you know, the reader that I wanna serve, the ultimate victim of that is the reader. By the way, Deborah, I, I wanna make clear, uh, if I could just jump in, I was not defending the practice or even suggesting that, um, it, that it's good for democracy and good for society, Qu quite, quite the opposite, I think it was implied, but I just was simply reporting on my behind the curtain interactions with so many, again, Democrats, Republicans, all regions of the country, young, old, um, 
women, men, although I would say that it tends to be that the younger the elected official, the more likely they are to be, feel, they haven't been burned enough yet. So they're still a little bit more open. <laughs> but the more, the, 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 more the, the more veteran elected officials tend to be even more careful. But I do agree with you is that, is that um, it, but I do want to make clear that I wasn't endorsing it. I was simply reporting on the phenomenon. Yes, and I think you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I see it all the time. And I will say, I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, when I talk to very media savvy scientists, right, they do get all of this dance. And they're very smart about, I actually had a, a behavioral geneticist once say to me, and, and this was in a, a sort of scandal involving behavioral geneticists. He said, I'm going to send you this letter. You have to get it from someone else right? You, can, you, you can't even use the information. You have to find the existence of this letter from someone else, but you need to know it's out there, right? I, and so I think, and I did get it, right? One of the things, my favorite things about being a journalist, and I think actually it's one of the reasons that I've been in the profession as long as I have, is I really love the process when someone throws up an obstacle or a roadblock I love the process of figuring out how to get around that, right? I, I mean, a, a no is like a bait flag for me, come this way, right? And so, you know, I am going to, when people, as you say, Seth, you know, act self-protectively, which I think I understand that perfectly, right? And, and, and I'm not saying that you're arguing that it's a good idea. I'm just saying yeah. that it's frustrating. But I, I also think that if you're any good as a journalist, when you run into that and you recognize that you're getting part of the story, you don't stop with that non-answer, right? And you go further. That's on us. Yeah. To accept a non-answer would be, you know, irresponsible journalism. Th then it becomes like Ken's comment, whether attributed to Orwell correctly or not, I don't know, but that it's no longer journalism, it's becomes PR. Because yeah. all, you, all, right. you do, right. all, you, all you're doing is becoming a reprint service for the for the stump speech of the elected official. Yes, and and I think if I could jump in, I think one of the one of the other reasons that uh, you see older, more veteran politicians who perhaps are even more cautious is they are often they have reached a point in their careers where they're better funded, so they have more consultants. And you know it, it, the the you know the if we look, there are some really good like. PR people that work in science journalism fields and, and lots, and, and I've I had tremendous help over my career from really good communications officers. But there's also an awful lot of really bad ones that just kind of get in the way. And, and, and that's kind of what happens here. But, you know, there are a couple other things going on here that are really important. I mean, everything that Seth said is, is, is exactly right about uh, why it is that people uh, often in public life just don't want to deal with journalists, but some of these problems are really structural about our society, and they've gotten worse. You know, the the one is while the internet and things like WordPress are are great for leveling the playing field for people who couldn't get their voice out before being able to, it also means that lots of people who aren't really journalists can kind of throw something up that masquerades as journalism. And while while activist groups who have their own blogs occasionally commit acts of journalism. Uh, they're often not really always journalists, and and uh, but who but 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 who do we want to to to, to write the definition of, definition of who's a journalist under the First Amendment and who's not? Well, if I get to write it, I'm fine with that. But anybody else, I might disagree with them sometimes. So I don't, you know, we can't get into de like defining that in some way that freezes people out. But but you know some of these kinds of problems that you see, I think most frequently with science, with reporting about science uh, are, are things like both sidesism. Uh, well, gosh, you know, uh, I, I need to write a story about climate change. So I got a Sierra Club spokesperson and I got a coal industry spokesperson. Uh, so I have covered my bases uh, and plenty of editors that I've worked for would say, oh, well, that's a fair story. We have both sides. When actually really there's, there, there in most stories uh, that involve science, there's number one, lots of different points of view and sides, but number two, there's actual what science is found and known to be provable at this point. Um, but, but 
one of the reasons that kind of journalism happens is that it's important for scientists to understand too, as members of our societies, there really is a crisis in journalism, in funding journalism. Uh, you know, the newspaper where I used to work went bankrupt. Uh, one of the reasons I left was we were seeing empty desks all over the room and we didn't have the resources to do the stories that our community need us to, needs, needs us to do. Uh, you know, uh, scientists at uh, University of North Carolina have produced some work about how many news deserts there are in the country. And there's lots of social science about what happens in those news deserts when they don't have vibrant local journalism, including vibrant local science journalists, somebody at a local newspaper who, who, uh, who understands a little bit about science or who even can like calculate percentage change, <laughs> you know? Uh, so so it, one of the things we have to decide as a society that scientists can be part of, uh, of, of helping society make good decisions about is, are we going to have quality journalism or are we going to have like uh, two different news networks that basically are people yelling at each other uh, or are we just going to have a bunch of activist blogs because if we're going to have good journalism we have to fund it and if you uh, you know the, I've watched one of the reasons we have like armies of PR people uh, and armies of political consultants and whatnot that kind of diffuse the, the truth for us and block the truth is that you, a lot of places in this country you can't make a living being a journalist uh, you can't pay your student loans, you can't pay your mortgage, uh, you know, and so, so this, this is a huge problem uh, that we face, and uh, it's something that scientists need to understand, and there's plenty of ways that scientists can help to, uh, to try to fix that. Oh, thing he just said. <laughs> so we actually have a lot of questions about that and how scientists can help. Uh, so scientists, as scientists, we're in a field with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of variability. And there were a number of questions about, you know, do you have strategies for us to communicate that uncertainty while maintaining our credibility? We don't want to sound like we're hedging, like we're trying to play both sides, but we do need to communicate that uncertainty and variability to the journalists so that they can communicate that widely and be transparent. Um, so maybe I'll throw it to Deborah first to see if uh, you guys have any strategies that we could utilize. Sure. And, you know, and this gets to what I've always thought of as one of the uh, sort of culture conflicts between science and journalism, which is that science is a process, right? And so when you're publishing uh, a paper, it's usually part of an ongoing, speaking of inquiries, it's often part of an ongoing inquiry into a particular question. It's not the end point, whereas journalism is an event driven medium, right? And so we'll often write about a scientific finding. This is especially true with a single paper, single source kind of stories, which I personally hate, um, as if it is like the end point, right? A total rev, and, that, and that's very misleading. So one of the things that we're now having quite a few conversations about in the community of science journalists is, you know, how do we better like, Put the context that allows people to see this is just part of a process. It's not the ultimate answer. It's, you know, a finding as we explore this issue. And that is something that I think we can do better as journalists. But I think it's also something that, you know, scientists need to actually recognize that we are thinking about these issues and trying to figure out ways to do them better. In the same way, I think Ken mentioned earlier, uh, the climate change problem of, of what we call false equivalence or false balance, right? We have Dr. A here, we have Dr. B here, but they're not equal. And in fact, only one of them may represent the scientific consensus. So one of the other things we're trying to do now as science, at least I hope as science journalists is to say, well, what is this? Where is the weight of the evidence? This is not a, you know, a two-sided issue. Climate change would not be, frankly, I, you know, one of the big other disservices I think we've done as journalists is, is to try to false balance vaccinations, for instance, right? Um, and, and look at all the problems that's ended up in so that we're in a position now where we say, here's the weight of the evidence, right? And we report it from that position. And again, I think in terms of scientists, I think the most important thing, there's, there's probably two layers to this. 
One is going to be talking to journalists and one is going to be direct communication, right? Um, and I think uh, in terms of what scientists can do, of course, what I want is for every scientist to say, yes, Deborah, you're working on a story on uh, the evils of soy formula, which was a story I did that led to all kinds of interesting interactions. Uh, let, let's talk about that honestly. Here's what we know, here's what we don't know. And I'm going to talk to you about both of those things so that when you write the story, you can put it in that context. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Here's what we're trying to understand. And I think really when you're talking to a journalist, those three kinds of goals, what we know, what we don't know, we're, what we're hoping to find out are really important in a good interview with a, with a journalist who's trying to understand what's going on. Um, and, and there's also the issue of scientists uh, communicating directly themselves, which I happen to think is important. If, if I, not, you know, as Ken pointed out, the number of journalists in this country are, 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 you know, shrinking and they're not everywhere we want them to be. But there's a lot more scientists than there are journalists out there. There's about, if, if you look at people who are self-described as science journalists, we number about 10,000 in a country of well over 350 million. Uh, that's a very small eye of the needle to get all scientific information through. So scientists also have to believe, and, and I don't think this is necessarily, you know, I'm taxpayer funded and therefore I'm stuck with communicating with the, to the public. Scientists also have to believe that part of what their job is is sharing information. You know, their work is interesting, it's important, it matters in people's lives. With that comes some weight of responsibility to want people to understand that. I, I don't really care if you're who you're funded by, but that guiding philosophy that my information informs people's lives and they have a right to hear it. And I, you know, I don't follow the mid 20th century ethic of real scientists only talk to other scientists. I'm the daughter of a mid 20th century entomologist, right? You, uh, there was a period of his career that you couldn't have paid him to talk to anyone who wasn't a scientist, right? So I know that ethic is there and I think we're still overcoming it. I'd like us to redefine the way scientists think about their jobs and not think about this kind of talking about science as you know outreach, which is layered onto my real job. I want them to think of it as part of their job. And I want the community of science to reward them for do, doing it too. That's my soapbox answer to your question. No, no, that's great. Ken, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with all of that. And I, I, I think, you know, I've been very fortunate to, to learn a lot from scientists uh, that's informed my work. Um, I, I think every now and then something that I write, raises questions in some scientist's mind that leads them down some rabbit hole that ends up in a really interesting sort of discovery. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, of back and forth there to be done. I think um, uh, one of the questions I like to ask scientists, especially if it's a topic I'm still kind of struggling with understanding is um, uh, ask them what they read and not just what, not just like what obscure journal they read, uh, but what, where are they getting their news? What are they, you know, what are they, you know, what, uh, there's been some great stuff on Twitter, uh, over the pandemic where, uh, uh, it's, it's been like, what's, what science writers do you, do you follow? And seeing some of the other journalists and scientists weighing in, I, I've like heard of journalists I never heard of before that are doing really amazing work. So I think that that's a, uh, you know, to the extent that like journalists don't ask scientists that, I think that that's a good thing for scientists to say is, hey, have you, you know, do you follow this? Even if it's like, do you follow this person on Twitter or do you uh, subscribe to this magazine? And, and I think, you know, another, another really valuable thing, especially if you're, I mean, if, if you're talking to, to if, if you're talking to Deborah, you know, some of these things aren't as important, but if you're, if you're at a university and the, 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 the local TV station contacts you, chances are, wild sort of generalization, that the journalist you're talking to uh, doesn't necessarily know what the 
what the key journals in your field are and probably doesn't have easy access to them. Um, but one of the things that's, and they don't, and they certainly don't understand different kinds of articles that are done, but one of the really fantastic things is, uh, it is to say to them, hey, you know, uh, two years ago, so-and-so published a survey article about this topic that gives you a rundown of kind of the state of the science on this issue. Uh, and here, I'm going to email it to you. I don't know if you have access to the university library here, but I'm just going to pull it down and send it to you because this, this will really help you understand what you and I are talking about. Uh, and, you know, if, if you get a journalist that's just like, yeah, I have time to read us. I don't have time for that. Eh, that's probably the sort of journalist you want to be a little more careful what you're talking about with. Uh, but, I, you know, I love it when somebody says, hey, uh, you know, uh, sends me an email and says, hey, this other person at this university, I, I just saw that they published this, and it's a really good uh, kind of primer on the topic. Uh, and so I think that that's a really important thing that scientists can do, especially for journalists with not as much science background, is just say, hey, here's, here's, the, here's, a, here's a real simple paper you should read that'll tell you what the state of the science is. That is great advice. Um, so, you know, for scientists, when we're communicating with journalists who have the time to go in depth, give them more resources to look at, tell them what you know, what you don't know, and uh, what you're hoping to find out. But if we're ever given the opportunity to talk to politicians, we're only given 30 seconds. So I was wondering if we could maybe uh, shift to Seth to ask a little bit if he had any strategies for, you know, as scientists, if we're trying to affect policy change, how can we approach our policymakers or are there other avenues that we can pursue for that? Okay, I think that, I think it's a wonderful question. I think it's an important one and that's the role of the scientist in society. And, and that is, are we, I'm not a scientist, but I'll, I'll speak for a moment as if I was, are we thinking of ourselves as an appendage to some other um, entity? Are we an appendage to the fundraising department of the university? Are we an appendage to a major donor who has a relationship that the university or the institution wants to deepen? Or are, or are we part of an organization that's trying to uh, pass uh, uh, ideas and agenda? Or finally, are we equal citizens in the society? And I would just argue that to the extent that you get those 30 seconds with the elected official that you just referenced, uh, Dr. Proctor, um, then you're just an appendage. And as I said, unrelated to the question, I wasn't expecting it, that if you think that you're gonna lobby just one time, you're gonna de develop a relationship or have impact, you're, you're almost out of your mind. You have no idea what you're talking about. It really takes a long time to develop that process. And so I would say in your capacity as a citizen, whether it's with your local mayor or local city council person, or, I mean, go as granular as you want to go, you know, is because uh, it's, it's easy to get to these types of people. It's easy to develop a relationship with them. Just, just take your time and to develop those relationships. And, and since politicians know other politicians, that Jane will introduce you to Susie and Susie will introduce you to Sam. And over time, um, although each of them sort of wants to guard both their source of funding and their source of information, over time, they will welcome you into their circle and that will benefit you uh, in terms of sharing uh, more inter, inter, in, in information there. Um, the other thing I would like to just say, one of the things is that very few politicians, very few elected officials have either a scientific background or a technical background, even the ones who are extremely well-educated. And therefore, since most scientists, and this is something that I, in my research for the two books, suffered from at first, um, scientists also speak English, but it's a different dialect of English. And so I would urge you when you have that conversation, whether it's, whether it's with a journalist, whether it's a person doing a book, or whether it's a politician, not dumb down what you're saying, but de-jargonize what you're saying. You know, uh, I, I, and I mean like really de-jargonize it. Make believe you're talking to your next door neighbor's second grader and assume that they have absolutely no technical knowledge or insight whatsoever, because these are smart people, or many of them are, and they can learn, but don't assume that they have shared vocabulary. And what happens is it's like when you're speaking a foreign language, if you have any foreign language capability, and suddenly somebody says a few words that you don't understand, and you're frozen, you're sort of in the translate mode, and then by the time you get back into the conversation, it's gone, you know? And I, and I would just suggest that there's a high value in, um, in, in making sure that you, one of the, the Deborah Ken said that, 
it, you know, if you, if, if you fail to tell the story right, it's not on the source, it's on you. I, I think the same thing is true here. If you fail to convey the information, it's not because they're, they're, they're dumb or uninterested, but it's because of the fact that you, you were not able to step out of your scientific conference uh, vocabulary. Great, this is fantastic. This is, this is awesome information. So there was a question that just came in uh, along the lines of another question. So in the, the academic world, at least, uh, there's this, this mentality sometimes of publish or perish. So if you don't publish something, um, if you don't publish enough, then maybe you, you won't you know, continue, you won't get grants, you won't get money, um, you won't get tenure or promoted. And, and so that's sometimes the mentality of people working in this space, the academic sector. But then there's this also um, paywall. So we have paywalls in the academic world, right? We submit a journal publication, maybe it gets reviewed and accepted. And the journal says, would you like everybody in the world to see it? If not, don't give us three to four thousand um, dollars. And so 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 many of the faculty have to make decisions about, well, am I going to pull four thousand dollars out of salary or something else to pay for this or or is it OK? Do you know if, in your experience, has the inability to access information about scientific studies, has, has that influenced, you know, journalist um, stories or, or maybe policymaker decisions or those by staffers? Maybe we'll start with Seth. And yeah, well, in my research for, uh, you know, I, I am with the University of Wisconsin School of Freshwater Sciences, University of uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences, and. Um, and therefore, I get sort of a, uh, an all-you-can-eat pass to all the academic journals in the world. I don't have no idea if the university pays for it or if it's a cooperative, you know, we let you look at ours and we'll look at yours. I, I don't know how it works. But as a result of that relationship, uh, I, uh, and that's, by the way, one of the very best parts of that relationship. Uh, there are many, but that's one of them, is, is that I get free access. But before I had that access, um, I faced oftentimes the issue of, do I want to spend $250 to get to read this piece, and uh, and 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 so because it was behind the paywall, it sounds a very expensive paywall. So it it stymied me, but then it ultimately liberated me, and I'll explain why very briefly. And that is, it's it's amazing to me how scientists are really hungry for contact with the outside world. They really want people to call them, <laughs> and so and so it's really kind of easy. You just Google their name and their academic affiliation. And you can find you their email or their phone number in about like nine seconds and either write them or call them. And with one exception, uh, one exception, it took me about 30 emails and about 20 voicemail messages left to get her to return my message. And then we developed a very warm relationship. Uh, uh, other than that, everybody calls you back right away. It's like, you really want to talk to me? Great. <laughs> you know, what do you want to know? <laughs> So, so, uh, so it's, 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 uh, you know, uh, yes, the paywall to the article is a problem, but I don't think that should be a roadblock to the relationship because before you get to the paywall, it tells you the name of the author, the subject matter. Generally, there's the, uh, you know, the pre C at the front, the abstract at the front. And, and so that tells you what you need to know. And then, then you can really have that interesting conversation with the, with the journalist. I'm sorry, I said the journalist could have the, or the researcher could have the inter interesting conversation with the scientist. That's what I meant to say. I, Thanks. Thanks. I could follow up on that because I think that's a really good point. And it, and it also reminds me of something I was going to say about uh, doing your homework. So, I mean, I'm a very nerdy science journalist. And, and so before I interview a scientist, I will look at them in um, either Google Scholar or PubMed or both. And, and actually look at what they've published. Uh, and a fair number of articles, I'm, and I'm really evaluating, you know, where are they in the field and what have they published? And you can look at how many times their work is cited. And there are a reasonable number of papers once you do that and, you, and you're kind of exploring, you know, the background of the scientists that are outside the paywall. And there's a fair number of, of journals, you know, from the whole PLOS universe, but um, even Nature and Science are doing some publications that are out there that allow you to get at um, uh, the essential information. And uh, if you're a journalist and you're going through an organization like AAAS, 
uh, you, there, there, and you register there as a journalist, you can get access to some of the big journals anyway and get at these scientific papers, right? I, and, and I will say that journalists like me who are based at universities will respond to the calls for help from other journalists who say, I can't get this paper, could you get me a copy? Right, I see this also happen kind of behind the scenes all the time. The most important part of that for me, you know, as a scientist working with journalists is to get some sense of whether the journalist actually is doing that kind of homework, right? I mean, if you're working with a journalist who hasn't, you know, even minimally looked at your background and what you've published, that is in fact, to me, a big warning sign uh, of how you're going to want to deal with that journalist. You should definitely talk in, in you know, common language English, right? One of my early editors at a newspaper in Georgia, you know, would say to me, what's this in English, right? Um, and, and you need to start thinking that way. But there is a give and take about this background of papers and scientists can learn something about the journalists too from whether they've actually looked at their work. And, and I will tell you one of my trade secrets is that I find it, I have a much better interview if I say to a scientist, you know, I was looking at this review article you published, right? Which is a signal that I've done my homework. And, and I really advise all good, all journalists to do at least do a minimal amount of homework there. I've been in situations where I was embarrassed by journalists who, had, you know, not troubled to actually do any of this. And I once was doing an interview at NIH with the head of their lung research program in the Heart, Blood and Lung Institute. And, and he canceled the interview because he had just done an interview with a Washington Post reporter who had started out by asking him where the lungs were in the body. Now that's a really basic, stupid example, but he was so angry. He's just like, I'm not talking to journalists, right? If they can't at least look at the basic biology of the body and have an idea of where the lungs sit, then then you're not worth my time. So, De 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 Deborah, I have to. I, I had the good fortune of both my books myself being the subject of lots of journalist inquiry and have sat for lots of interviews, including uh, I have a, a very favorite two stories. I'll only tell one of them. They're both equally the same idea, basically. I was invited to be on a 35 minute uh, uh, long uh, nationally syndicated radio show. So it's vast reach, a name that you probably know. And I come on it, they bring me down to the studio. I have the headset on, it's the big professional microphone in front of me, I sit there. And we're about 30 seconds before going on air. And the host says to me, so your book is called Troubled Water. Um, what kind of water are we talking about? This is sort of a 35 minute interview. What kind of water are we talking about? <laughs> Plastic and seawater, drinking water, lake water. What kind of water are we talking about? So I said, Joe, that was the name. I said, Joe, I said, do you have my book in front of you? He says, yeah, it's right here. Why? I said, just look at the subtitle. It's called What's Wrong With What We Drink. Ah, drinking water. OK, good evening. We have Seth Siegel here this night. He is an expert in drinking water. <laughs> and off to the races for 35 minutes. <laughs> you know, like, OK. I don't know how he did it, but he, he, he got his way through. But yes, that's the same thing. Where are the lungs in the body? Right. And those are extreme examples, but I think, you know, when you're in this give and take between a journalist and a scientist or a journalist and a book author, you know, that tells you exactly where you stand. I mean, I mean, to, to, to just throw one more thing in the mix here about the discussion of paywalls and things that I think is really important. You know, I have the experience, I, I, I did a really stupid thing and started a blog um, called Cold Tattoo that I wrote for 10 years or so. And um, one of the things I, I, I thought I would try was let's have a, uh, uh, a comment section that is smart, uh, that's not Facebook comments, that, that is um, uh, show your work, bring some evidence to the discussion. Um, and sometimes it worked. We had like, uh, you know, mining engineers and, and uh, people talking about strip mining in really smart ways and uh, uh, it, it, sometimes it worked, but, but one of the stumbling blocks we hit all of the time was that there would be an interesting new paper about some topic related to coal. And yes, I had the paper because while I didn't have a subscription to that journal, I just 
did what Deborah said. I called that scientist and said, hey, I, I see that you have this new paper. Could you send it to me? I have never, ever in 30 years had a scientist say no to that request. Always, they always send it to me. Um, but I had it, but when I tried to post, when I would post a link to the journal, it was behind a paywall. Right. So like commenters on my blog would say, hey, uh, that's behind a paywall. I, I can't read it. And it costs, you know, $60 for that one article or it's $200 a year for the subscription or something. And so, uh, you know, information is power and, and uh, democratizing this process is really important. And I'm empathetic to the idea of paywalls having spent a lot of my time uh, dealing with people who complained that stories where I worked were behind a paywall. And I would say, we well, need to support our journalism, subscribe to the journal, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, in the end, that's really kind of a hollow response to the idea that uh, information needs to be available. And, and that's, I mean, that's why, like, new models of journalism, I think, are really pushing into everybody ought to have access to information, and we need to fund the journalism in every ways. Uh, and I think that that's something science is grappling with too. And, and some people are further along the idea of accepting that, that information wants to be free uh, than, uh, than others are. Uh, but, but particularly, I think it is um, important when, when, the, when the public helped pay for the science in the first place, uh, there's like a thing that average Americans find galling that uh, we pay for the science, why is it hidden behind a paywall at some fancy journal I've never heard of? So, I mean, I, th I, th I think there's a lot of progress being made on that, but not nearly enough, but, but both journalists and scientists should be on the same side here because I want as many people as possible to read my stories and scientists want as many people as possible to understand the value of their work. So I 100% agree with that. And, and I think if you look at uh, some of the big scientific publishing enterprises, they're not struggling for money the way journalism is, right? I mean, Selvier and some of the other big publishers, they're rolling in money, I say. So, you know, there's also that particular issue. It, you reminded me that I, when I was a blogger for Wired, before I came to MIT and didn't have time to do this. I was a blogger for Wired about chem chemistry, but I did one story about a, uh, a Virginia scientist who uh, accidentally swallowed a nematode and then found it crawling around in the tissues of his mouth. It, 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 if you went to Wired and you looked up this story, how to read a scientific paper about a, a researcher with a nematode in his mouth, um, the scientist sent me the paper, but the paper was paywalled at the Journal of Tropical Medicine. So I had to actually just put in the blog, you're not gonna be able to read this, right? Here's the paywall. And, and that doesn't really serve anyone, right? I think we could go on all day about paywalls. Uh, it's a really hot topic in science. You know, When you have to pay for an article, we're not getting the money, even though we did the research, we have to pay to make articles open access. So that's a whole nother issue, <laughs> but I did uh, want to ask about a separate issue that we are grappling with, especially in our subfield of drinking water right now. And that is how to communicate risk without trying to be a fear mongerer, I guess, and try to, you know, how do we walk that balance? And how do we know if a journalist's, what a journalist's intentions are with the information that we give them? Uh, I know I've Feel like I've been trapped in interviews where they're just looking for that sound bite that sounds so scary. Um, so, you know, how can we walk that with journalists and even with policymakers? You know, how do we walk that line, I guess? So, I'll leave that open to whoever wants to jump in first. I, I, I'll, I'm going to say, kind of jump in, I would just say that um, I think it really goes down to integrity. And I be, I'm a believer in the concept of the longer, shorter way which is you can have the, the, the shorter way is, you know, what did Deborah say, clickbait. You know, the shorter way is getting yourself into the boldface column of some gossip sheet or whatever. But that doesn't, that doesn't really ultimately either enhance your career or really it certainly doesn't affect systemic change. And therefore, while I believe that there is a, a very real concern and a very real problem with our drinking water in America, uh, and certainly around the world as well, but certainly in America, 
Um, I am not going to give in to hysteria or to, or to a demand to say inflammatory things or anything that isn't proven by the science. And I have a wonderful publisher. It's a, one of the major publishers, St. Martin's Press. And at one of the meetings talking about the book jacket, somebody threw out the idea of, you know, why don't we talk, why don't we create the, why don't we have the subtitle, The Poisoning of Your Children? And I said, I refuse. I said, she's, so the woman said, it will sell so many more copies. I said, I just refuse. I said, I said, I don't want to go down that road. I don't care how many more copies it would sell. And I think the same thing is true for journalists and scientists and everybody in that world is, is be honest, stick to the facts. One of the best interviews I ever did, by the way, Ken, it was with a West Virginia scientist. Uh, one of the best interviews I ever did, I, I asked him a question and I was trying to get like, under the, under the skin of just how bad something was. And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this interview into three parts. He said, I'm gonna tell you what I know for sure. I'm gonna tell you what I don't know at all and I don't think anyone will ever know. And he says, and I will tell you what I think is the case but I can't prove. And I love that answer. I, and I ended up giving him a very prominent place in, in my book. I love that answer. And I went back to him actually several more times for clarifying not just his own interview but other people's comments. And, and really, I, I loved it because he was so clearly not going to give way to this inflammatory thing that we have at this moment of thinking that it's just about the moment and, and that it's rather a very long journey. And that's why I think everybody does well to keep their integrity, to make sure that what they say is something that can be backed up. And when it's not, you simply say, this is what I surmise, but I can't prove it. Or there are things that you'll just say, as the scientist said to me, there are things that we don't know and maybe we may never know. I think that's I think that's that's so great. And I, you know, I think one of the things that political leadership, one of the places where political leaders often fail is that they're afraid to say they're afraid for the answer to any question to be, I don't know. Uh, when often when it's the accurate answer, it's like the one they ought to give, and I, I'm always, you know, I, I'm always super impressed when, when, when I get some form of the, you know, I don't know, or we don't know, or science doesn't know yet, sort of, sort of, sort of answer. And I, I guess that, you know, to to kind of put this in in a little bit of context, um, I think that uh, for so many things that are part of everyday life that science journalists uh, are charged with informing the public about. Um, if the public knew how little we really knew, they would be scared, and it is scary, and they should be scared. Um, uh, does that mean they're going to drop dead tomorrow if they take a drink of their water? Well, of course, it probably doesn't mean that uh, in most places in the United States. Uh, but um, I, I, I think there's there's often too much of a of a of a focus on um, trying not to scare people. Um, and uh, being worried about hysteria, and and while I agree with everything, you know that 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 Seth said, and I, I agree with what Deborah said about there's a lot of journalists that are sitting there looking for looking for the we're the the there that particular situation's version of how we're poisoning our children, uh, and they're looking for that. They're looking. It's it's you know it's it's the 60 minutes interviewer asking. The interviewee the same question over and over and over and over, trying to get exactly the right, really scary soundbite that can that, that that they can show and then show the watch ticking, uh, you know. But but I think that in, in our case, like in West Virginia, the the during the incident when I met Dr. Weldon, it, uh, people were shocked in West Virginia to know how few chemicals that might end up in our water have really been tested very thoroughly, um, and. Uh, if they're shocked and scared, then they get to own being scared. I mean, I think, I think that we, as journalists and as scientists, uh, families have the right to enough information to make decisions about their own lives and their families and their safety. And we have to be, be honest with about that. And so, so when you get into the question of, okay, let's make sure that we're only talking about what's proven by the science. I think we have to, to step back a little bit from that and talk about the, the, the precautionary principle. And, you know, are, uh, in, in the example of chemicals, are, are, are they guilty? Are they innocent until proven guilty? Or are they guilty until proven innocent? Or, you know, from what framing are we looking at the basic question? And do we have to, 
that's part that's scientists can science can only inform the answer to those things uh politics is how we decide the answer uh but when we get to that part of it we have to understand who has the power and if the and uh, so it's important to remember that we can we can sit here and rattle down example after example where the information, which is power, was all in the hands of the asbestos companies, the cigarette companies, DuPont, uh, on and on and on, a government agency. Uh, so in in trying to to grapple with the issue of how do we how do we explain risk in an accurate way, uh, we have to remember that. Uh, that information that goes into some complicated risk assessment that maybe no average person is ever going to read or understand, the information that goes into it is power. So we have to be, we have to democratize that information in some way. Power and money. Um, I, so I've been a toxicology journalist for about 10 years now, which means I spent most of what I do write is about things that are bad for you. Um, and I spend a lot of time, therefore, navigate, navigating risk, uh, what you should worry about, what you shouldn't worry about, how to keep this risk in perspective. Um, I, you know, you get into situations where uh, there are what I think of as poster child compounds that everyone obsesses about, BPA being one. BPA, you know, has some interesting effects on the female reproductive system, but it's not like a huge health risk to everyone, but it became one of those poster child kind of compounds and you need enough information to figure out, you know, is this something I should worry about or not, right? And, and we don't always do that well. I agree that, you know, it, it, you also do a disservice by underplaying risk because you're so worried that people are going to freak out that you downplay the danger and sometimes the danger is legitimately there. And one of the things I think is really important to think about when we look at uh, exposure to toxic compounds, and, and you're absolutely right, if you look at the you know, toxic substances inventory, the majority of the compounds that are registered in there have not been studied, right? And in the United States, if you look at the FDA, and then I'm gonna get myself back on point, FDA follows something called the generally recognized as safe principle rather than the precautionary principle that they use in the EU. And that doesn't always serve us well. And in fact, my final point is we, there are compounds and there are compounds in drinking water and elsewhere that we actually know are dangerous. Asbestos is, is an example of something we know is dangerous. Uh, lead is an example of something we know is dangerous. Arsenic in drinking water is an example of something that we actually know is dangerous. Uh, that doesn't mean that, and that, that we regulate according to what we know. We regulate according to power and money. So even if you look at the 10 part per billion standard for arsenic in drinking water, uh, which was up from the 50, it was 50 parts per billion in the uh, late 20th century. And under George W. Bush, it was uh, lowered to 10 parts per billion. The recommendation was three, three parts per billion because inorganic arsenic at that part per billion level, in fact, does a lot of harm to the circulatory system. Um, and if you go and you look at the actual documents regarding the setting of that standard, you see the calculation made by the US government for how many more people are gonna die if it's 10 parts per billion rather than three. But the reasoning is that uh, you, you know, water utilities couldn't afford to get it down to three. And, and the water utilities made that case. Yes, we know that it would be safer at this level, but we can't afford to do that. And so you see this dance between power and money and knowledge. So even when we have, my point is that even when we don't have uncertainty, when we have a certainty that something is dangerous, we don't always act in the way that I think we should. <laughs> I judgmentally think, of course, that we should put the protection of the average citizen first. But that's only one of the factors that goes into the decisions about how we regulate risk. And people yeah. need to know that too. That's uh, great information. Can, uh, can, I, can I just say one quick word on Deborah's point is that what she says that she would put the protection of the public first. 
I would too, by the way. And that's uh, if Deborah and Ken, if Andrew, Andy, if you could send me Ken and Deborah's uh, mailing addresses, I'd like to give them both copies of Troubled Water. I think they would both enjoy it. I hope so, at least. But I but I will I, I will say is that that my point, Deborah, is that you would put the consumer first. I would put the consumer first. I would bet most people would put the consumer first, but the consumer doesn't have enough information to even know that this is an issue right now. And, and the politicians will respond immediately as soon as they get the 11th phone call on a given morning from the public saying, we demand, you know, I'm a mom, I want this, or what am I hearing about that? And suddenly they're gonna, where is it gonna go from having no staffers who work on water issues, they're gonna have a key staffer who's gonna be briefing them every morning as part of the morning briefing meeting. That's how we make the transformation. It's to take it from our agenda to transporting this into a popular concern, a popular awareness of what the issue is. Now, if the public then decides, I don't want my water bills to go up, I'm prepared to take a risk of getting you know, cancer. Okay, that, that's, that's an informed democratic decision. We can't protect and ourselves if, against if, everything. And if, I, I, I think that that's all, those are all great points. And, and I think that the, the, the only kind of observation I would make about it is that, is that it assumes that those 11 calls carry as much weight as one call from a corporate CEO. And that's not always the case. And that's why like people like me exist so that uh, the, the time when the CEO outweighs those people from the community, that gets exposed. And, and like the, the, the hope is that if there are enough people that are going to do what I do, then uh, that office holder is afraid that wow, you know, if I don't listen to these people and I listen to this contributor who's a CEO instead, somebody's going to find out I did that. And that's well, going to come out. By the way, it's, gonna... it's, it's not just donations. Right? I mean, donations are certainly a factor. It's also employers in the district. Right. You become, exactly. afraid, you become afraid that either they'll talk against you or that they'll close the factory and that'll hurt your local economy. So it's a lot of different, again, I don't want to just make it monochromatic that it's good guys against bad guys. There's a lot, there's a lot of competing interests always in these, in these points. My point is only is let the public become well-informed about these issues so that they can make a decision about it. And, and, so, and, 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 and so that's, but I agree with you is that maybe it's not 11 phone calls that will flip the elected official. Maybe it's 13 or maybe it's 300. But, but, what, what, but what we do know for sure is that even devoted uh, elected officials who are very devoted to a given industry association can be flipped as soon as the public starts thinking about it in a different way. And, that, and that's, that's really what my life's work is about, I would say. Oh, can I'll, I just say one? Can I just say one other thing? Yeah, of uh, since I'm giving Ken and Deborah free copies of the book, I can't. I see there's about 65 people on this call, so I'm not giving everybody a free copy. But what I would love to do is, if anybody, I mean, I maybe Ken and Deborah feels the same way. Uh, this really is my life work: is reaching out to the public. If there are people who are out there who, who I, I see there's about like 12 questions that I haven't answered yet, I'd love. I mean, if I could to just say, anybody visit me at www.sethmsegel. I'm like Mary Siegel, S I E G E L. I, you can email me, get get to me. I will I answer all questions within 24 hours. If anybody would like to have a dialogue in the same way that I have been educated by others, I am eager to pay it forward. And maybe if you are among those lucky few, yes, you too will get a free copy of the book. Okay. <laughs> so I think that makes a great segue to trying to wrap up this event. Um, as Seth mentioned, we have a ton of great unanswered questions and I'm sorry we don't have time to get to all of them. Uh, we have some students who are, you know, interested in becoming science journalists on the call. We have scientists, you know, still interested in, you know, how do we reach out to journalists and policy and make that effect. So um, with all that in mind, I would like to turn it to each of our three panelists to maybe say some final closing remarks um, before we wrap all this up. And maybe I'll start with Ken. Sure, thanks. Uh, well, this has been fun. Um, uh, I'll look forward to reading the book. Please do. <laughs> okay. um, I'll get your mailing uh, address. Thank you. Not now, though. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the, the stack, the to read stack grows taller and taller. Uh, it's, a, it's, a uh, quick, it's a quick read. You can read it in a week. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I mean, I just I want to come back to something that I really think is, is important is is there really is, I, I think, a shared value between scientists and journalists that's about uh, what Deborah talked about uh, an honest inquiry into something, um, but also about the transparency to what that inquiry is and what the answers are and what the basis for the answers are and what answer what questions 
that are part of that we don't know the answers to. And I think that um, uh, I certainly learned a lot from scientists over my career who come at things with that shared sort of transparency. And, and I think that um, a lot of the other things uh, of, you know, well, what's off, what's on the record, what's on the, what's off the record, you know, does this reporter actually read any of the stuff that uh, is in the field that I'm researching? I think those are all kind of um, uh, totally navigable issues uh, that uh, lots of people can continue to work on. Uh, and as frustrating as they can be when they don't uh, immediately get resolved in each individual situation. Coming back to that shared set of values about inqu honest inquiry and transparency of the answers, I think will will help all of us kind of get to a, a better place. Great, maybe we can move to Deborah for her final thoughts. Yes, I loved what Ken said about the, the sort of shared interest we have in honest exploration of information, because I think it's important, uh, you know, for the people in the scientific community to recognize that we do have that joint wish to get good information out there to enable people to make decisions that are based on research and science and evidence, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I really believe that that's one of the most important things that we do as journalists is that we're, we're relentless in, in our wish to get you know, the, the information out there. I, I, I used to say when I was teaching journalism, you know, that nothing good grows in the dark except maybe mushrooms, right? And that what we do as journalists is try to illuminate all of these different corners. That's gonna make some people uncomfortable. And I think it's really important to recognize that that's part of the process too, that sometimes as journalists, we're gonna be shining a light in an area that some people are not gonna want that to happen. Some people are going to wish that could still stay in the shadows. And it's our job, you know, in the interest of getting good information out there to not only illuminate the things that everyone happily wants to see shared, but to illuminate the things that people don't. And, and for people to recognize what a service I think that is, it's actually one of the things that bothers me most about the loss of local journalism. And I started out working for small newspapers in Georgia. So I feel really strongly about this because I know that things are happening in those small communities with, with city governments that people just don't know unless you have journalists who are trying to share that information. So I also hope that we recognize going forward how important this public sharing of information about science is. And that although we may have conflicts, we're basically, as Ken says, on the same side in that goal. Beth? Yeah, I'd, I'd like uh, to just say uh, two quick things. First, I, I, very important to me to say a very big thank you uh, to uh, Andy and Caitlin for organizing this and making this all happen. Um, I got to know Andy uh, late, in the in, late in the research for Troubled Water. And I really many times have wished that I had gotten to him as my first interview because I would have loved to have had him as my Sherpa guide through lots of other things that I was told by public officials and others. Uh, I don't, Caitlin, I don't know you very well. I like you already, but I don't know you very well. But I just want to say a word of endorsement that Andy is, is like the dream citizen scientist as far as I'm concerned. He is passionate about public health and public safety. He doesn't want to cut corners and really is eager to tell the story and tells it in a way that we can all understand it. And so uh, for those, uh, a a a Andrew Welton was the, was the moderate co-moderator here, but he very well could have been either the panelist or the model for the people who have tuned in today to this. So, so uh, I just want to say thank you for putting this together. And I feel very honored to be with uh, Deborah and Ken. I, I know your backgrounds and it's really quite something, uh, really quite amazing what you guys have, have, the honors you have received, but also the work that you have done. So, so it's a pleasure to do that too. I just want to say if I may, a, a final very small word to the, not to the journalists on this call, but, but to the scientists on this call and the administrators on this call. Uh, and, and that is that, you know, we've been talking about this interview and that interview and this senator and that senator. And I bet there are more than a few of you who are sitting there saying, 
what? What are you talking about? I never spoke to a journalist. I've never, I've never met a journalist, you know? And I think it's important for you to understand that your work is not just the way Deborah spoke of her father, which is just in the laboratory or just in the classroom. It doesn't go any farther. I, I've been asked about the book writing process and I maintain that there are three parts to writing books. And I would say there are, should be three parts to your work as well. The first part for me is the research. The second part is the writing and editing. And the third part is the propagation of the ideas underpinning the book. And I think the same in some form is true for you as well. First is of course doing the research. Second is writing your scholarly papers and teaching your students. But the third is to make sure that the work doesn't just speak for itself and that it just sits there waiting for somebody to discover it. I would argue that every, every grad program should have at least a small course and I'll, by the way, I'll volunteer to teach it, a small course in how to get my ideas out there. And that is so important because journalists will be glad to speak to you. The public is eager to hear this information, but the scientists I meet are sort of stereotypically shy or they don't want to beat their chest or they don't want to have attention called to themselves. And you are not necessarily doing your own work a favor by doing that. Forgetting about career advancement, I'm just talking about the ideas. And I think that that's, that's something that you should have carry with you, which is that it's a plus, not a negative, for you to want to propagate your ideas to the widest audience possible, not just academics. I interviewed one professor who said to me, I'm excited if my article is read by 12 people. And I said, but why would you want it to be read by 12 million people? He said, well, why would I care about them? I only care about scientists. No, wrong. You care about those 12 million people because those 12 million people are the ones who are gonna make your ideas saying about grants and all that, aside from that, but to make your ideas turn into reality. So I'll stop with that in the interest of time. But I, again, thank you so much. I'm so honored to have been part of this. Same, and I did want to say, um, to Seth's point about the fact that some of the questions aren't answered, that I, I'm absolutely happy for people to follow up with me. Um, easy to find at MIT. My email is dlblum at mit.edu. Um, and, and I would look forward to hearing from anyone who had felt that they had an issue that didn't get addressed and wanted some follow-up seriously. And, and I also echo uh, his comments about Andy um, and, and Caitlin. So I think I met Andy when I was writing about the West Virginia water spill for Wired actually, and uh, we've stayed in touch ever since because, and I will tell you this, good science journalists keep their good sources, right? Well, thank you everybody for the kind words and for tuning in today and for panelists, thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to be here with us. Um, we have, I have about 40 more questions that we prepared um, and you know, this has gone, you know, we've been talking for an hour and a half, so um, I could suspect we could have a week long Zoom meeting. Of course, there's probably federal laws against that with OSHA and such. Um, but, you know, thank you very much for the, the time that you've, you've spent with us today. Um, you know, questions came from listeners and people that are participating on the call. Uh, many of these are for young faculty, older faculty, uh, accomplished individuals as well as leaders in industry and government. And so thank you so much. We'll be posting a copy of this video at plumbingsafety.org. And I'm going to share my screen with you right now. And so <clears throat> um, major funding was provided by the US National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation uh, is an independent federal agency created by Congress in 1950 to promote the progress of science, to advance the national defense, and <clears throat> to help drive health, security, and welfare throughout the nation. Uh, NSF supports basic research and people to create knowledge that transforms the future, helping to drive the U.S. economy, and more information about them can be found at nsf.gov. Support was also provided by Purdue University and the Purdue News Service, the College of Engineering, the Lyle School of Civil Engineering, Environmental and Ecological Engineering, and Agricultural and Biological Engineering. And today we have snow here at Purdue University. Uh, it's very beautiful. 
More information can be found at www.purdue.edu. And I want to bring your attention to the U in Purdue. Uh, we do not make chickens here. So P U R D U. But you could. <laughs> we, 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 we could grow chickens. We won't make them. <laughs> um, so thank you all for listening in. And thank you again to the panelists for taking the time out of your schedule. We deeply appreciate your time and knowledge that you've shared. A copy of this event will be posted at plumbingsafety.org. It won't be tomorrow, uh, but it may be uh, early next week. <clears throat> and if you have any questions, please let me know. If you're looking to get in touch with somebody, please let me know well. So the meeting has ended. Thank you all for listening in and have a safe week.